Did you bring a Bible to church today? Who said no? Dave, what am I going to do with you? I'm liable to go off the deep end one of these days. and You would never know it. Um, let's see here. Where do I want you to turn? Uh, I'll, get, I'll get there in a minute. I'll get my mind going in a minute. Uh, Y'all had a good week? Had a good week? Who's had a rough week? Yeah, okay. Well, this is this I'm hoping is your message. Um, turn to 1 Corinthians 10, if you would, please. 1 Corinthians 10. Appreciate everybody being here. And um, this is the end of August, September. We're fixing to get into that change of the year. And leaves are going to change colors and... It's going to get pretty here before too long, and that cool weather is going to move in. Some of you like it, some of you don't. Can't please everybody. So, that's probably why God split everybody up after the Tower of Babel. He split them up by, by uh, language. And then the Bible says in the days of Peleg, God divided the earth. He just basically just tore... North America and South America ripped them off Europe and Africa and said, y'all stay away from each other. Quit fighting all the time. That probably was a good idea. But anyway, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I want you to get the biblical basis of what I'm going to lay out for you this morning very quickly. And then I'll just sort of explain to you the verses that we're going to go to, in some cases, we're going to, we're going to deal with whole stories in the Bible. And I'm not, I, I'm not going to really take up the time to read all of the passage of every, uh, of every story. But we will read the highlights. Some of it will be up on the screen. Some of it we'll just look at in our Bibles. But I want you to know that there is a scripture. There is a place in this Bible... For every person that God calls and every situation in life that God places you in, there is a place in this Bible for you. This is it's called the book of life. It is also, I like to call it the book of my life. I've never, I've yet yet to go to the Bible and not been able to find something that was relevant for something that I have been through in life, something that I am going through in life currently, or something that I read that and I say, well, boy, that might, ha I don't know if that's going to happen to me or not. And sure enough, it does. So I'm just telling you right now that the answer to every issue in life is right here in this book. Whether it's in the form of doctrine or it's in the form of the promises that God makes through the prophets or it's in the form of the stories that are told in the Bible. And these stories have a reason for being there. Mom, I don't know if you remember this. You and I was, went out to lunch one time. We was over at the Chinese restaurant. You were going to teach something to your class down there at DeSoto out of something that I think was in the Psalms or something that David went through. And you asked me the question, why did David have to go through all those things he went through? You remember that? And I said, well... You're reading about them, aren't you? Yeah. And I said, that's why. Bible tells us that David, out of all of the people in the Bible, David was a man after God's own heart. I was reading this morning. I woke up about six this morning. The best thing to do when I wake up that early is start reading. 
And I read this morning, and there was a place there, I believe it's in the book of Isaiah, that mentioned the sure mercies of David. Now, I don't know exactly 100% what that means, but I do know that God had a lot of mercy on David. And I think part of what that means is, if God had mercy on David, God offers you the same sure mercies that he had on David. In other words, if you foul up, God certainly is a God of mercy if you will confess that sin to God. God will forgive you. And so this morning, let's read uh, 1 Corinthians 10. Uh, very quickly, moreover, brethren, I would that you now should, be, should not be ignorant... How that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now watch this. Verse 6. Underline this in your Bible. Put a big star by it. Highlight it. Whatever you do. Make a note by it. Now these things, in fact, let's read this out loud, verse 6. I want everybody to read this out loud. Ready? Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. So what it's telling you is that these stories that happened to Israel in the Old Testament are a warning to you to not go after their wickedness and do after their ways and think that it be okay with God because it won't be okay with God. And God will start getting in a judgment mood. God will get to the point where He'll say, I've had enough of your sins. I've had enough of you snubbing your nose at God. Doing what you're doing with absolutely no shame whatsoever. God says, I've had enough of it and I'm going to deal with it. And everybody is going to know that I'm God when I pour out my judgment upon you. God's going to make you the example of everybody else. And everybody else is going to go, whoa, I'm not going to do what they did. Then he says, verse 7, Neither be idolaters as were some of them as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. I want you to stop and think about that. God killed twenty three thousand people one day. Because of the sin of fornication. Verse 9, neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of the serpents. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now, verse 11. I want you to do the same thing. I want you to put a note there. Highlight it if you would. Draw a big circle around verse 11. Maybe make a note in your Bible. And I want us to read this one out loud together. You ready? Now all these things happen unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Now let me read verse 12. Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. So, the things that I'm going to present to you this morning, boy, I tell you what, I struggled. I, I, I had... In my mind, the places I wanted to go to, and I mean the devil fought me all day long. This message should have took me probably no less than an hour to put together. But it took me almost all day to get through it. Now, let's go back to Genesis 3. That's what I have up on the screen. And before we read that, we're going to go to prayer. Now what you just what's just been read to you, what's been explained to you, is something that I learned, and it, I'll tell you what, it changed my reading of the Bible. 
it literally changed my reading of the Bible. It went from, do you know, I have to read this to, boy, I can't wait to read that to find out what's in it. It literally did that. And I want you to understand that all these things that we're going to read, even though they were written aforetime, meaning they were written in the past, they were written for us right now. And I promise you, there is nothing in this book that is irrelevant for today. Had a guy years ago started coming to this church. He was going to a, I don't know, Church of God, Pentecostal church, something like that. And the women were all speaking in tongues. And he went to the pastor with 1 Corinthians 14. And he said, Pastor, there's something I don't understand here. He said, it, you know, the, the tongues are supposed to be done in order. One person is supposed to say it, then another person is supposed to do it. And then possibly a third, but no more than that. And then one is supposed to stand up and give an interpretation. And he said, but not only that, he said, you've got women all over the church speaking in tongues. And it says right after that, let your women remain silent in the church. And the pastor said, well, that was, that was written for them back then. That, that's not written for us. Well, then what Paul said, what you just read out of Paul was a lie. If Paul said that everything written in this Bible is not only for those in the past, those in the present, it's also for those in the future, then all of it applies. There's a lesson in all of it. And if God said that the women are to keep silent in the church, especially when the giving of tongues is going out, then you shouldn't hear a bunch of women going... How did I do? Did I do good? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we ask your blessings upon this message. Lord, I pray, dear God, that you would help me preach it uh, the way you want it preached. Lord, I don't know if, if I can add anything to this or even if I should. I don't want to mess it up, but I do want to give it understanding i want i want people to see it for what it is and lord i'm asking you god to bless the words that come out of my mouth i don't want to say something that's wrong i don't want to say something in the flesh i pray dear god that you would just help me today i am just a very very weak vessel lord that that the goodness of the Holy Ghost can be poured out of this vessel. It's an absolute miracle of God. Father, I pray, dear God, that you would reach down today where somebody is in their life right now. And you would give them understanding. Father, I pray that you bless your word now and bless these hearts that hear it. Lord, use it for, let your word not go forth void. Father, accomplish what you send it forth to do. And may your will be done, and may your word and your name be praised. We pray this in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. Now, I'm going to go through some, some Bible stories. We're going to deal with some issues that I believe affect probably everybody who sits here this morning, everybody who's watching online. And... Um, I may say some things that, I don't know, you may not like. I may say everything that you like. I may not say anything that you like. But what I'm asking you to do is I'm asking you to go to the Word of God in prayer and ask God, do what I did. God, are these things true? Okay? So Genesis chapter 3. Uh, turn there because let's get the context of it. Uh, we have Adam and Eve in the garden. They are in a perfect state. God has given them uh, plenty of things to eat, plenty of things to drink. Uh, they are in the garden in a perfected state. 
They are both naked before each other then and they have no shame whatsoever. And um, so here they are in the garden and everything seems to be going well. But then there's that tree and I just suspect that Eve, having been told from Adam what God said about that tree, probably would have just left it alone had it not been for the deceiver. This is not in any way just a message to ladies. It is also a message to men as well. It is a message for everybody sitting here today. And here's the gist of it. Uh, let's read verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, if God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent uh, said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Which was a direct contradiction of what God said. He lied through his teeth, told her that she wouldn't die, but that is exactly what God said would happen. Now we pick it up in verse 5. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, let's look at, just for a few minutes, what this fruit contained. What was it that after Satan said all that he said, what was it about this fruit that really drew Eve in? I mean, if the devil would have said, uh, uh, Eve, see that pile of cow manure there? If you eat that, you can be like us gods and live forever. How many of us would seriously consider eating a big wad of that cow pile? No, not one. No, not one. But that's not what he had her looking at. He had her looking at something. Let's read what it says. Verse 6. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, which is the opposite of cow pile. And that it was pleasant to the eyes. And a tree desired to, be, to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat. Gave also unto her husband with her. And he did eat. Now, the book of James says... Uh, love not the world, neither things in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is of the world and is not of God. What well, just so happens, the very thing that, that caught Eve's attention once she was tempted to really look at this fruit was that it automatically drew or worked in her Lust in her flesh. And then it worked in her lust in her eyes. Now, here's what I'm, I, I'm calling this message God's trap. Because once those two things, especially those first two things, were in her. Lust in her flesh and lust in her eyes. Those two things in life are absolutely inescapable. Am I telling the truth this morning? I mean, if you tell me that you don't ever lust with your eyes, 
I call the man on the phone a liar. Because he called me with this Seventh day Adventist nonsense. You guys gotta go, you guys gotta keep the law. You gotta keep the Sabbath law. You don't go to church on Saturday, so you're not following the law. And I said, let me tell you something, bud, you're not either. Well, I am too. I said, you mean to tell me that because you go to church on Saturday, and this is exactly how I put it. You go to church on Saturday, and these good looking women coming in your church. And they bend over and you're not, you never try to look down their blouse or you never look at their daughters or you never lust after a woman. Are you trying to tell me that? God took that away from me years ago. I said, you are lying through your teeth. God gave us these laws that to us it is inescapable. We cannot escape violating these laws. Not with this body. We can't do it. Uh, turn to um, Exodus 20. I've said this a hundred times before. You, you might say, I've never cheated on my wife. Okay, I probably believe you. You say, I've never cheated on my taxes. Okay, that's fine. You say, I've never, uh, I've never killed anybody. All right, whatever. Now tell me, how, tell me how it is that you never covet. Tell me how you get through a day, a week, a month. Without coveting something that somebody has. And, and, and let's just, I'm going to try to say this in a, in a rated G way. And let me say this, there's nothing wrong with a man wanting a good wife. Amen? It's not good that the man should be alone. There's nothing wrong with a man wanting a, to have a good wife. And then to have that marital relationship with that wife. There's nothing wrong with that. Adam and Eve were in the garden together. They were in a perfect, perfected state. And by the way, they were all alone. So nobody would see them. And they were naked. And they were not ashamed. There was no shame upon them in their marital state. But that very thing that draws a man and a woman together to want to live in holy matrimony is also the thing that can get us in the most trouble and destroy the very marriage that we say we wanted. Can I hear somebody say amen? You, you get what I'm saying? And then he adds the blessing of children. Oh, I would give anything to go back to the days when my little girls were little and Matthew was little and, and we could be in those happy, innocent days with them again. Because they were, they were pleasure to us. Pleasure to us as, as moms and dads. We used to love to laugh at them and laugh with them and hear the little funny little things they said and see the little fingers sticking out under the bathroom door like that. But that in itself, the act of bringing children into this world, in its very nature, God has embedded lust into this body. So that you see things, and you've got a house already, but somebody's got a nicer house. And so you say, well, I got to have that nicer house. And the first thing that God said out of his mouth, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. First thing he said. And, and like, again, if I could show you the picture of the house that we built for them out in Kenya. Actually, we built 
what amounts to almost a Taj Mahal compared to what's around it. Because their house has a metal roof on it and the other houses around there just have a grass roof on it has to be replaced. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. And I'm here to tell you people that is in us. We always think, ladies, that maybe some other man might be better than our man. Or guys, you might think that some other woman out there is better than your woman. And then we covet. And in that coveting process, we have already broken the very commandment of God. And see, what all it took was us desiring something that we can't have to begin with. So you know what happened is? God, in essence, led you into a trap. He said, in fact, this is the tenth of the Ten Commandments. And the first, the first one that is a benefit toward mankind is honor thy father and thy mother. Well, the very process of a teenager growing up to be his own or her own person, naturally there is going to automatically be a pulling away from mom and dad. And that itself leads to a, what amounts to a minor rebellion. Because they want to start doing things their own way instead of doing it the way mom and dad told them to because they have to go out and find out for themselves that most of the time their own way won't work. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. And God put it in our flesh. To desire things that by righteousness sake we cannot have. So what do we do? We are stuck in this body that God says don't lust, don't covet. But we find ourselves doing exactly that. That's God leading you to the law. The law, my friend, was never intended to save you. Because the law never saved anybody, did it? And why didn't the law save anybody? Because nobody ever kept the law. No one did. So do you understand now what God was doing? Let me give you a verse. I just, I've quoted this so many times. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of, lest any man should boast. You know what God is not going to allow when you get to stand in front of judgment, in front of God? You know what God's not going to allow you to do? Hey, it's me. I finally made it here. Let's throw the party. I kept all of God's laws. God's not going to allow you to do that because there was only one that did that. And his name was not your name. His name was Jesus Christ. So all of that lust. In you, all of those desires in you, though they have a benefit as far as marriage is concerned, having children is concerned, providing a roof, a nice roof over their, over their heads and giving them warmth in the wintertime, a cool house in the summertime, and, and, and all of those good things that we enjoy, there's nothing wrong with that. But along with that, we start, we don't stop there, in other words. Paul said, having food and raiment, therewith we ought to be content. But we don't stop there with just food and raiment. We've got to have more food and more raiment 
and more shoes. Amen. We never stop there. So all of that that God has put inside of our flesh by its very nature violates the law of God. But why did God do that? In Romans 5, it tells you that it's because God was making sin exceeding sinful. And what does he mean by that? He means by that, that just because you're Ron and Sandy and you sit on the front row and you make notes on all my sermons and you all wear identical shirts and they look nice and Christian and everything else. Well, they're just the same kind of nasty, filthy, rotten, dirty, hell-deserving sinners as Cubby sitting on the back row back there. And you know how I know Cubby's are dirty, rotten, nasty, filthy, hell-deserving sinner? Look, look at the emblem on his shirt. No, 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 just kidding. Because he's no different than me. God didn't make your pastor any different than you either. I've had to deal with my own lust, my own covetousness, my own lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh. I've had to deal with all of that. And you know where that road led me? To the cross. Led me to the cross. Which is exactly what God had in mind. If you talk to most Roman Catholics and ask them, how do you get to heaven? Oh, if I pray and I go to the priest and I do good deeds, then I hope I'll make it there. But they never will say, I have a guaranteed spot in heaven. But you can say that, can't you? Because God led you into the trap of your own lust and your own covetousness. You took that then because you knew it was wrong in God's eyes. You took that because you tried to quit and you couldn't. You tried to give it up and it, it didn't work. Then you started listening to Dr. Phil. Then you started trying to get self-help books and you tried to get this counseling. You tried to get that and none of that worked until you went to the cross. And God forgave you. Now that didn't mean that right then that was going to end. And I'll show you that in a minute. Colossians 3 verse 1. If you then been risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set, watch this. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. For those of us who look after the things of this world at lust and covet and desire and want God says I've got something way better than anything in this world that you could ever covet after Donald Trump's got Mar-a-Lago I've seen pictures of that over from overhead Boy, it looks like a nice place to live but I guarantee you, and he's worked and earned and earned his money to be able to have something like that. But I guarantee you, mine in heaven's a whole lot better than his. And I ain't done nothing for it yet. And never will. It was built for me by grace through faith. It was built for me when I knelt at the feet of the cross of Jesus Christ. God forced me to come to Him with my sins and my covetousness and my lust. God forced me to come to Him. And when I came to Him, God said, Mike, my grace is sufficient for thee. That's where I learned that from. Verse 3, For ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with Him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. First thing out of His mouth is fornication, uncleanness, 
Inordinate affection, you know what that means? Not having ordinary affections. What was it, David, you were saying during Sunday school? They're, they're normalizing pedophilia. They call them minor attracted persons now. That is disgusting. But they're normalizing it. That is an inordinate affection. It is an affection that is not ordinary. Inordinate affection. Evil concupiscence. Concupiscence is one of those words we don't use anymore, but it just means fooling around. And covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. So, which one do you want? Do you want... And here's Mick Jagger singing in the background. I can't get no satisfaction. While you chase down the lusts of this world and the inordinate affections of this world, you chase those down thinking that you're going to get the ultimate rush out of it, but you never will. Trump's got this house. Maybe at some point he'll say, I need a bigger one. Let him build a bigger one. I guarantee you, mine's still better than his. Okay? Set your affections on things above, not things down here. Amen? Let's move on. Turn to Exodus 14. Now this, this, my friends, is a trap. This is a trap if I've ever seen one. I read this one time and I just about did somersaults. Boy, that would have been something to put on YouTube, wouldn't it? If you look at a map of the Middle East, where the land of Goshen is, and where Israel is, they basically could have just, they were in the north part of Egypt, they could have basically just kind of Walked up to the Mediterranean Sea, followed the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, and they would have been right there in the midst of the land that God gave them. Would have been, at best, at best, maybe a, a month's walk, and they would have been there. But that's not how God wanted them to go. The Bible says in Exodus 14... And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before Pihahiroth. God said, Turn. Okay, you're going straight. No, I want you to turn right. I want you to go east. And I'm going to lead you across this, this path that goes through these mountains. And you're going to end up at the Red Sea. Now, God didn't tell them that yet. Because probably if he would have told them that, they probably said, well, why should we go that way? Why don't we just go north like we planned on it and we'll be up there. But God didn't tell them what he had in mind. God didn't tell them the whole story yet. And that's why God hasn't told you everything he's got planned for your life. Because if he did, you probably wouldn't do it. And so he said, and uh, before it you shall encamp by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart that he shall follow after them. And I will be honored upon Pharaoh, upon all his hosts, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. God had a plan whereby he was going to save Israel and in the process destroy all of their enemies. Wouldn't you like to have the enemy of lust destroyed in you? Wouldn't you like to have the enemy of lies destroyed in you? Wouldn't you like to have the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death? What in the world? Man, the glory of the word of the Lord shone so brightly. So God said, turn and go over and camp against the Red Sea. And I'm going to go get Pharaoh. And I'm going to harden his heart. 
And I'm going to drag him over there to you. So really what God did was lead them into a trap. They've got the Red Sea on one side. They have just come through this mountainous path to get to the Red Sea. Meaning that there's only one way in and one way out. And God brings Pharaoh here. The Israelites are here. The Red Sea is here. Where are they going to go, Ron? No place to go. And let me tell you something. If God loves you the way He's loved me, He will lead you into a trap. God will force you to rely on Him and Him alone. Somebody say Amen. So in verse 10, when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And they were sort of, wouldn't you be afraid? Don't sit there and tell me, oh, I, I, I'm so full of God, I would never be afraid of that. I guarantee you, you see a nine, or what, however, what do you have, 600 chariots coming after you? And Israel don't have no chariots. You would be afraid. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? You know what I've said to God a few times? God, what'd you do? Bring me all this way so that you could just hang me out here in front of everybody? Is that what you did? I've said that to God. You know what God did? Anyway, just had mercy on me. He knew I was scared. Verse 12, Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And I'm just, I'm just curious. I wonder how many people who are in our generation, guys, that grew up in church and they were made all these promises of what some preacher told them God would do and those those preachers either lied or those people didn't believe the word of God and they busted out of church and they're never coming back again you know what kind of people those were those were people who just weren't going to trust God no matter what. It had been better us for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you and ye shall hold your peace. How many of you would like your enemies gone forever. I'm talking about the enemies of your lust, the enemies of your pride, the enemies of your hypocrisy. Living a hypocritical joke where the people that really know you, they know you're a fake. If they were to ever meet people in this church, they'd say, you know so-and-so, yeah. Yeah, he comes to the bar with us every Friday night. To be made free... So that you never, ever have to face those devils again. That's worth trusting God over, isn't it? Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, see the salvation of the Lord, which he shall show you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. Well, what did happen? Okay, what did happen? Uh, let's turn. Exodus 14, let's look at it. 
Look at verse 23. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning watch, the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians and took off their chariot wheels. And they drave them heavily. So that the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand over the sea, and the waters may come up again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength. And the, morning appeared, and the, Egyptians fled against and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots, and the horsemen, and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them. And I, there are pictures, I've seen them, and I believe them to be true. They, they, are, they have found chariot wheels at the bottom of the Red Sea, just like they're supposed to be. Encrusted over, but they're there. The children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea. And the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw that the great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians. And the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Now, I've got way more. And I don't want to keep you and I don't want to drag this out. I do want to give you the rest of it. But I'm going to stop right here and I want to ponder some things for a minute. You will find yourself in impenetrable circumstances. In other words, God will have you up against walls that you cannot get around, you cannot climb over, and you cannot bust through. And God will do that for a reason. The biggest reason is that that's probably how God is going to destroy your enemies. But then there's the part of this is where God teaches you how you can trust Him. I wish, my wife always tells me, you tell them too much about you. Well, I like being honest. There's some things I just won't talk about. But there's been several times I've been up against that wall. And thought at times, this is the end. I'm not going to make it. This is how I'm going to die. Or this is how my life in Christ stops or this is how the devil destroys my ministry or any number of things. This is how the devil's going to bust up Lisa in our marriage. This is how he's going to destroy our children. And there's just been several times that I've been forced into that trap. And didn't know how to get out of it. And thought I was gone for good. And every time. I cried out unto the Lord. And God heard me. And God either. Remove the wall or taught me how to build a nice little house by it in a church. 
taught me how to live with it. God either, you've heard me say this, God either removes the thorn or He gives you the grace to live with it in you. Either way, God gets the glory out of it. Somebody say amen. And that's what it's about. It's not about you self-glorifying yourself. Look at what I did. I got myself out of this. I got myself through this. It's never going to be about that or God won't have anything to do with it. If what you're wanting God to do is all about what you do and how you did it and how you overcame it and how you, how you performed this or you did this or you did that or whatever and that way you get the glory. If that's how it's going to be, you can expect nothing from God. And I've got, I'll well, probably four or five more deals to show you. I'll probably do that tonight. But this morning, I want us to bow our heads. I'm going to go ahead and invite you down here to one of these mourners' benches. It's going to be a time of prayer. But if you're here this morning, or you're listening to me online, then your couch or the side of your bed, or your kitchen cabinet, or whatever. It's going to be your morning bench this morning. And you're going to fall down upon it, and you're going to mourn. You've been full of lust. You've been full of covetousness in your flesh. Coveting more money. Coveting more cars, coveting better houses, coveting somebody else's wife, coveting somebody else's uh, husband, or shoot, in these days, coveting somebody's daughter. But you're full of covetousness, you're full of lust, and you can't make it stop, you can't make it go away, I had somebody said that a Mormon told him this, that if you just, uh, all you men, if you just, if you just withheld for 21 days, you would never lust again. That's the stupidest thing I ever heard in my life. If it was that way, then all of us men could live in sinless perfection. But it's not possible. And God's got you backed into a trap that you cannot get out of. And you've tried. You've tried everything in the world. You've tried every way in the world. It's not happening. Now maybe there's something God's going to deal with you about. When He gets that done, then He'll start working. But whatever it is this morning, I'm going to give you time this morning. God said, I read it this morning, 6 o'clock this morning. God said this, the house of prayer for all people. And this morning, maybe you're dealing with sins that you cannot stop. Desires that you have no control of. Desires that you know are not pleasing to God. Let me tell you something. You're not alone in this room. You're not. You're up against the wall. You've got Pharaoh on one side. You've got the Red Sea on the other. And even in your complaining to God, God's still going to be good to you. Because He swore in His righteousness. That he would do this for you. So would you come. Take advantage of one of these benches. So what if you think it's an admission of guilt. All of us are guilty before God. There ain't, listen there ain't a soul in this place. That does not fall under most of what I preached this morning.
If you want to hide and act like it doesn't exist, I feel real sorry for you, especially when God is giving you an opportunity to call upon Him. Appreciate God moving in some men. We need some good men in this church. We need some good leadership. Is there any ladies who want to come this morning and pray? I think the better part of this message is probably going to be tonight. So I would encourage you to either come and hear it or listen online. But I'm going to pray for you this morning. And even for those that are hiding, I'm going to pray for you too. Father, we come before you this morning. And Lord, this message was so hard to just, to just get the verses out. I don't know why. But Father, I've, I've been through these, I've been down this road, I've been through these things. God, I know what you can do. And Father, my heart goes out to every man, every woman, every young person who is willing to call unto you this morning and say, God, I need help. I need help. And Father, give us understanding and give these men understanding and any woman this morning that you may not do it all in one day. You didn't, you didn't rid Canaan land of all of its enemies all in one day. You didn't do that. You did it little by little. So Father, maybe, maybe, with, maybe with somebody, God, you're going to deliver them just like that. I've seen you do that. But Father, maybe it'll take a little while. Help them to understand, Father, that if you leave the thorn there, you're going to give them grace until it's time to be healed. But Father, these people, Lord, that are calling unto you this morning, they recognize that they have, they have fallen into a trap. And it was a trap, God, that You've been waiting for them to show up in it because that trap leads right to the cross of Jesus Christ where all of our infirmities are healed by the stripes of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray, Lord, that you'd bless those that called out to you. Lord, give them grace. Bless the remainder, Father, of this teaching tonight. Use it for your glory. Bring honor to your name. And Father, help us, each one of us, Lord, to walk out of here and say it has been good to be in the house of the Lord today. Bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said... Amen. Amen. Would you stand to your feet this morning?